the trial in the case of Dominic Ongwen started on 6 December 2016 at the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Dominic Ongwen, alleged brigade commander of the Senior Brigade of the Lord's Resistance Army, LRA, is accused of 70 counts of war crimes and crimes against humanity, allegedly committed during attacks against the civilian population in Lukodi, Pajule, Ode, and Abok IDP camps between October 2003 and June 2004. This trial is about violence and misery that blighted the lives of millions of people living in northern Uganda. Ordinary citizens, civilians, who wanted no more than to be allowed to live their lives in peace, could no longer live in the villages in which they had been born and raised. Further, the prosecution alleges that from at least 1st July 2002 until 31st December 2005, Dominic Ongwen, Joseph Cony, and the other senior brigade commanders were part of a common plan to abduct women and girls in northern Uganda that were then used as forced wives and sex slaves, tortured, raped, and made to serve as domestic help, and to conscript and use children under the age of 15 to participate actively in hostilities. The accused pleaded not guilty to the charges. Do you make an admission of guilt with respect to any charge? Well, in the name of God, I deny all these charges in respect to the war in northern Uganda. And the second question, uh, you, th you therefore plead not guilty with respect to all the charges, I assume. Yes. ICC proceedings are governed by the Rome Statute and all legal texts that were adopted by the state parties. The three judges constituting the trial chamber in this case, presiding Judge Bertram Schmidt, Judge Peter Kovacs, and Judge Raoul Pangalangan, are responsible for conducting fair and expeditious proceedings with the full respect for the right of the accused and protection of victims and witnesses. Throughout the trial, they are guiding the proceedings, ensuring that the laws are respected at all times, and in the end, will decide best on the evidence if Dominic Ongwen is innocent or guilty of the crimes with which he is charged. The prosecution called its first witness on 16th January 2017. It marked the beginning of the prosecution's case. The Office of the Prosecutor intends to provide a variety of evidence, including radio communications, testimonies of various witnesses, forensic reports, but also photographs and other images, videos and other documentary evidence. Expert witness, Professor Tim Allen, first prosecution witness, testified on 16th January 2017. He is Professor of Development Anthropology at the London School of Economics, who lived for many years in South Sudan and Northern Uganda. He produced for the Office of the Prosecutor a report on the origins, purpose and objectives of the LRA and the effect it had on the civilian population. There is always, there always has been um, ambiguity about those involved in the Lord Resistance Army. As I mentioned earlier, the LRA's military tactics were rather different to the Holy Spirit movement. The LRA has always used fairly small units for its military activities often operating fairly independently from one another. But they have, in addition, abducted or uh, people have been drawn into the LRA in rather large numbers, and particularly when the LRA were based in South Sudan and were receiving support from the Khartoum government. Um, a rather large number of people were living with the Lord's Resistance Army, cultivating fields and so on. So there's always been ambiguity between those people who have been, who have gone to be with the LRA, many of them abducted, um, and those who are actually involved in the fighting. Um, the numbers involved in the uh, military campaigns have been, I'm suggesting here, between three and four thousand, probably at the peak, 
rather less um, in recent years. Joseph Connie and his commanders were, astu were uh, no, astute at dealing with um, guerrilla warfare of various kinds, broke up into smaller units, um, and were able to outflank the Ugandan forces and began operating again in northern Uganda. They hadn't operated very much in northern Uganda for a while and began to operate again in northern Uganda um, from 2002 onwards with um, um, serious implications for the population in the IDP camps. By the end of the 1990s, I believe something in the region of um, 800,000 people were in dis displacement camps, as I mentioned earlier, by 2004. I mean, some estimates of people in displacement camps were as high as 2 million. I don't believe it was ever quite that high, but 1.5 million is not an unreasonable estimate. Witnesses are examined in the courtroom by the prosecution and the defense. Mr. Nguyen is represented by a defense team led by the defense counsel, Mr. Crispus Ayanodon. The defense is conducting its own investigations and has the right to examine prosecution witnesses, to present its case and its witnesses, and to present documents, videos, photographs, maps, and other material as evidence. Legal representatives of victims can question witnesses upon the approval from the chamber on issues relevant for their clients. Protected witness P0403 testified on the 18th and 19th of January with the protection measure of image distortion. The witness is an analyst at the OTP situation analysis section. His task at the office of the prosecutor related to the Owen case was to find case relevant data in the logbooks and of intercepted LRA radio communications. He wrote a report about radio communications between different members of the LRA related to the four attacks on IDP camps. The witness told the chamber that the LRA used radio communications to coordinate operations and meetings, to pass messages, to report, and to update operation plans. According to the witness, LRA commanders had about 30 radios and could communicate from northern Uganda to the South Sudan. These radios, he said, were looted from the Ugandan army, UN, and some religious missions. Aside from Tonfas, they used various other encoding systems in the radio communication, such as Metaphors, for example. I focused on the four charged attacks. Uh, as I was advised by the prosecution team, those uh, attacks being relevant to the charges against Mr. Ongwen. Um, so I focused on, on the intercept communications um, where those attacks were communicated. I did not uh, include any communications of uh, calls for attacks in general prior to the attack taking place that may or may not have been associated with any one attack in speci uh, specifically. So I focused on the, any LRA radio communication with regards to an, an attack from plus or minus, a, uh, sorry, minus a day or two up to and including a, uh, up to a week uh, after, the, after the attack. So basically the information uh, that is known to the OTP, uh, communications associated with any one particular attack. Um, in addition to that, I also looked into four dates that I, I, it was random to the degree that I picked one date from any one particular year during the charged period. So I picked one random date uh, in 2002, another one in 2003, and then 2004 and five. But uh, so the years I selected, but um, I chose the dates at random. And then out of the communications uh, or the intercept summaries from the communications of that particular day, I then myself chose uh, which information to, uh, to include in my, in my comparison. So I did not include all of the radio communications, uh, or sorry, all of the communications discussed on that particular day. The same way I did not include all of the communications from the particular days in relation to the four charged attacks. When they were talking about uh, seemingly unrelated uh, matters, I did not include those. I focused on, uh, on the mentions of the attacks and the reporting of the attacks. Now for the four uh, dates that I chose at random and then the not random selection of uh, which 
details and which reports to actually compare and contrast. I was looking for something that is uh, unrelated uh, to the charges against Mr. Ongwen and something that can be uh, perceived as menial and everyday enough in the LRA communications just to see the level of reporting between the various logbooks that I came across to see what they deemed relevant uh, enough to include in the communications and what they did not. In the pretrial brief, the prosecution alleges that from at least the early 1990s, the LRA used high frequency radios to communicate internally and that by 2002, it had developed a sophisticated method of communicating by radio. Joseph Cohn was often hundreds of kilometers away from these troops and he used high frequency radio to issue orders and communicate with his senior commanders spread over a large territory. In the continuation of the trial, from 23rd January to 3rd February 2017, three radio operators testified at the trial of Dominic Nguyen, two former LRA radio operators and one working for internal security organization in Uganda testified mostly about the LRA radio communications. Protected witness P0016, who testified from 23rd to 26th January with the protective measures of image pixelation and voice distortion, said that he was a signaler, radio operator, in the LRA. He spent some time as a radio operator for the senior brigade, allegedly under the command of Dominic Nguyen. Witness P0016 testified that he was kidnapped by the LRA in Uganda and taken to Sudan, where he was later injured and trained to work as a radio operator. During the training, on the first occasion, we were instructed on how to handle the radio. Uh, the second, uh, next, we were told how to connect the radio, how to, uh, about the, the batteries. We were instructed how to open the radio, how to uh, put up the antennas. We were told, we were taught about the codes, uh, A, B, C, D. After that, we were instructed on how to create tonfas, how to receive messages and also how to try uh, the radio. We are told to try radios with the, uh, our colleagues, show them how to, 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 to do this, how to open it, and, and after that, we were assigned jobs. You're assigned to work with somebody as a, uh, you're assigned to work with somebody who already has experience so that you can learn, but you know that when you're speaking over the radio, people's voices change, but you're also taught on how to clarify the voices so that when somebody is talking on the voice, if the voice is not clear, then the, the person's voice can be uh, clarified. There are some that were not clarified. Kassat was not uh, clarified, but Kassena that was given to us by the uh, Sudanese government was clarified. But there are certain radios that the LRA had that did not change change the, vo the voices of people. So you had to get used to the voices of people. If you're not used to the radio, sometimes you're afraid of receiving messages. So we were taught on how to receive messages. Also present in the courtroom was witnesses legal counsel Mrs. Sarah Kerwegi, appointed by the ICC registry for the matters of possible self-incrimination. The LRLA leaders who were allowed to have radios. Um, Joseph Coyne had different duties. His was about trust, but those who had radios included battalion commanders, brigade commanders, up to the people who reported to Coyne. At the time that I was about to leave, captains could also have radios especially if he was assigned for a particular duty, he is given a radio to go with. He further said that all the commanders had radios and call signs. The call sign for Dominic Ongwen was Lima Charlie. To preserve the confidentiality of their talks, LRA officers used code language, Tonfast code and proverbs. Tonfast. 
A tone fuss is some kind of cord. It's like a key. If you want to get into a house, you use a key. You use the key to enter into the house. Messages sent through tone fuss. The tone fuss messages were sent through esoteric codes. If you did not understand the esoteric codes, or if you're not aware of those codes, then you would not understand the messages. And that's how Tonfas was used. Several radio intercepts, recorded radio communications, were played in the courtroom. And a witness identified voices of Joseph Cohn, Vincent Oti, and Dominic Ongwen, and different signalers, among others. The witness further said that these particular intercepts were about attacks on different locations in the north of Uganda. Witness. It is written here on the shoulder. Uh, when they say here Lupol in a chole, that means those in the skies have given ranks to the people. That means Kony is saying that his spirit has given ranks, uh, and these ranks are normally placed on the shoulders. In another intercepted radio communication, the witness recognized voices of Dominic Ongwen and Vincent Oti, who were talking about an attack on Lukodi. The witness confirmed that Dominic Ongwen was saying that he was the one who ordered the attack and that some of his men did not come back. I think we all heard what he asked that called what Padano, what Padano, and then what he said, Tem Wehibong, go ahead. Then what he asked, who attacked Lukodi? And Dominic responded, that was me. Then what he said, I heard that they burnt more than 100 houses. And then Dominic responded that, yes, it was my people, but I have not met them yet. There are two issues there. First, he said, he was the one who attacked Lukode. And secondly, he said, those were his people, and he had not, he had not yet met up with them. I think that's what we all heard. The witness said that others in the bush came from Joseph Cohn, and in his absence, they came from Vincent Oti. Witness P0059, who testified from 27th January to 1st February with the protective measures of face distortion, is also a signaller, but for the internal security organization in Uganda. According to the prosecutor's pre-trial brief, he was ESO's most experienced and best interceptor. He listened to LRA radio communication for over 10 years. The office of the prosecutor collected the records of several radio operators, including witness P0059 and some others covering the period from 2002 to 2005. This bulk of evidence includes about 5,000 pages of notes, almost 8,000 pages of logbooks, about 5,000 pages of faxed copies, 300 UPDF intelligence reports, 15 police intelligence reports, and 610 sound recordings. Witness P0059 worked in the barracks of the UPDF Infantry Division in Gulu. He said that he worked and slept in the same office so that he could follow the LRA communications at all times. Did any the work, first of all, is to let the government know the plan of the rebels, the, that is the LRA rebels, um, so that uh, the government can find uh, solutions or ways to combat uh, their activity and protect the security for the security of Ugandans. Secondly, I was also told that when I work, I should put everything on record 
because it would help in the future. Because of that, I would record everything that comes from uh, the radio. I would put it in cassettes. Uh, the voices are the ones, the, what I recorded is the one that probably made me to come here now. Witness P0059, Father talked about his daily work. Every day, he recorded LRA radio communications on a tape recorder and made draft notes. He would send reports by fax to ISO headquarters in Kampala and make records in the UPDF notebook. On a number of intercepted radio communications played in the courtroom, witness identified Joseph Cohn, Vincent Oti, Dominic Onwen, Raska Loquia and Okot Odiambo as the ones who were talking the most on the radio. He said he could recognize their voices and call signs. Oti Vincent. I recognized Oti Vincent's Kid voice. One, Dominic Ongwen. I also recognized Ongwen Dominic's voice. Oti used the call sign Tem. Tem is an abbreviation for Temwere Bong, which is Dominic Ongwen's call sign. The witness said that the LRA used Tonfast to encode their radio communication messages, but also nicknames, jargon, and altered acholi that would sound like it had no meaning to make it more difficult to understand. As I have told you, this is not an easy job. First, I was trained as a signaler. Secondly, I consent traded on my work uh, so that it can heal fruits. I listen carefully so that I can get some information from it to help the government of Uganda. Thirdly, I also thought one day such rebellions will, will end and uh, certain things need to be recorded for Scots such as these. On another series of intercepts played in the courtroom, the witness recognized Dominic Ongwen giving operational reports from various places in northern Uganda, each time listing items seized during the attacks. Besides ammunition and guns, Ongwen once reported bazookas and a diamond, then a Motorola phone and other items. Joseph Cohn told him to keep the diamond. Witness P0440 Former LRD operator testified with the protection measures of face and voice distortion from 1st to 3rd February 2017. Mrs. Sarah Kerwegi was present in the courtroom as counsel for the witness and was appointed by the registry for matters of possible self-incrimination. He testified about his abduction and his experience at the LRA until August 2004 when he managed to escape. <laughs> Often, the people selected to be radio operators were at least some people with some background education and who can be who can read and write. And once those people have been selected, what kind of training would they receive? Uh, the training offered concerns how to tune in the radio, how to change the channels, how to send messages through the radio, and also how to move to the place from where you're supposed to send the messages. Those are the main things which are first uh, taught to the trainees. The witness father said that Joseph Cohn, the overall commander of the LRA, was the one who was deciding on the content of the messages. Many times when he has some idea that uh, maybe to abduct some people, then he would instruct that you 
go and collect food or if there's a group that can get people to abduct then they can do that the witness said that Dominic Ongwen was one of the commanders who typically followed Kony's orders and was referred to over the radio as Tem Wekibong. Well, they would delegate subordinate commanders to go and do the tasks because uh, they themselves would not be in a position or they would not want to do the job at that particular time, so they would delegate it to subordinate commanders to junior commanders. Witness was also asked to identify and summarize intercepted radio communications. In one of the intercepts, witness recognized the voice of Dominic Ongwen, who reported that he had come back from a mission in Odek, and that nine Ugandan soldiers and many civilians had died. When asked if Joseph Kony was the ash commander who enforced discipline, the witness said that he was sometimes strict and sometimes kind. Yes, I know that uh, people who were under his command and the orders that he would issue, people were actually afraid of the orders that he would issue. Sometimes they would respect it because of fear, they, because they, they would not know exactly what he was going to do at any particular time. The trial in the case of Dominic Ongwen will resume on Monday, 27th February 2017.